Welcome, everyone. Welcome to GTR UK conference. Um, my name is Eduardo Pedreira. I'm absolutely delighted to be leading what I personally consider to be uh, one of the, the best panels uh, since we all went virtual. Uh, the, the attention and, uh, of course, the focus is uh, on global Britain and, and the impact that will have uh, with the um, relationships, trade relationships in particular uh, between Britain and, and Africa. A bit about myself, I am the head of Emerging and Frontier Markets at Crown Agents Bank. Uh, Crown Agents Bank uh, intermediates mostly uh, foreign exchange, uh, emerging frontier markets, foreign exchange, uh, not only on the trading side, but also on the uh, payments and delivery. We do a lot of work with Africa and we're very proud of that. Um, and uh, on my spare time, as they say, I'm also a board member of the uh, ITFA, which is the Global Trade Finance Industry Body, as I'm sure you all know, um, leading the, and very proudly leading uh, the Emerging uh, Leaders uh, Initiative. Um, I um, am joined by, by a great uh, set of panelists today, and uh, in a minute, uh, they, they will take uh, some time to introduce themselves. But just to position uh, today's panel, so on the 23rd of June 2016, uh, Britain voted to leave the, uh, the, the, the European Union. And uh, that came with a lot of controversy. We were nearly for four years dominating the headlines uh, with, with Brexit. Uh, but the, the reality was uh, that Britain has left the European Union on the uh, 31st of January 2020. And with that came the, the concept of uh, global Britain, uh, which is now being uh, heavily uh, advertised and explored, uh, making Britain a powerhouse of, uh, of global trade. And, and of course, uh, for all of us who are domiciled here in the UK, that's good news. And um, we, will take, uh, we will take quite a bit of time here during this panel to discuss how that's being implemented, um, challenges. And of course, we, we, given that we are a, a group of financiers, uh, and, and this conference is about trade finance, uh, we will want to know if the financial infrastructure and the legal infrastructure as well are there uh, to potentiate global Britain, particularly with this angle uh, into, into Africa. Uh, we will try to round up the, the, the discussion fo focusing a little bit more uh, on, uh, on the future, where the relationship with Africa should focus. Uh, we will uh, throw in uh, the usual uh, key topics, key hot topics of the day, uh, ESG, fintech, of course, education, uh, and uh, a little bit of an overview of what we, we can expect uh, from global Britain and Africa uh, going forward. Enough about the intro. Uh, let's focus on um, the, 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 the main reason why we're here, to listen to three amazing panelists. Um, I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Denise, the floor is yours. Thank you, Duarte. And, and, and thank you very much to you and GTR for inviting me to take part in today's conversation on behalf of ABSA. As you say, I think we've got a fantastic agenda, so looking forward to diving in. Um, so I head up the international client coverage function for ABSA um, based out of our London office. London is one of two international offices that ABSA now has um, in, in London and New York. We are a Pan-African bank. We operate in 12 markets across the, the, the continent, predominantly Anglophone markets in Southern and Eastern Africa, as well as West Africa. Um, and um, we are very keen to support UK exports and investment activities into Africa. So thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. Emma? Great. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Emma Wade-Smith, and I'm Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner for Africa. 
uh, represent the UK government based in South Africa and uh, leading trade and investment teams across 21 different African countries uh, across the entire continent. And uh, my role really is around uh, boosting, driving, increasing the value and the volume of trade and investment between Africa and the UK. Uh, and we do that between uh, looking at the overall trading environment, uh, understanding what some of the individual market access barriers are, and then really promoting and supporting individual commercial deals. Thank you very much. Andrew. Thanks, Duarte. Um, yeah, I'm Andrew Skipper. I head up the Hogan Lovells Africa practice. Hogan Lovells is a global law firm. Uh, and for decades, we've operated across the whole of Africa. Uh, on a personal level, I have um, broad interest in Africa. With Emma, I'm the co-chair of the UK government's Africa Investors Group. Uh, and with Denise, I'm on the advisory board of the South Africa Chamber of Commerce, and I think Emma's on that as well. Um, uh, I'm on the Council of the Royal Africa Society and on the Working Group for Legal Services for the Nigerian EDF. Uh, I'm probably more interested in African art than much things, and so I'm on the Vice Chair of the Advisory Board of the Smithsonian African Art Museum. So that's me. And Thank you. Quite, uh, quite remarkable for, uh, from everyone. Right, let's get cracking. Emma, let's start with you. And um, you, you know, as a preamble, I would like to say that uh, I'm a big admirer of the work that you do. You've been absolutely a dynamo in promoting uh, global Britain uh, in 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 Africa. You've been pretty much everywhere, and we've <laughs> met quite 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 a few times. And uh, it's always a pleasure. Emma, Brexit happened. It's a reality. Uh, we went through four years of ups and downs, a lot of media coverage, as I said in my introduction, uh, but it happened. And, um, and now we need to make the most out of it. Um, how is it going in terms of, uh, in terms of the UK-Africa relationships? Uh, the, Africa is absolutely key for the, uh, for, for the concept of global Britain. In practice, how are British investors and exporters benefiting from, from uh, the new Global Britain initiative? Yeah, well, look, in some ways, it's, uh, it's a little bit too early to say. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has rather skewed uh, our ability to understand what's happening and, and where the, 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 the levers are coming from. Um, but look, during that period where you said, you know, we've had nearly four years of uh, ups and downs, uh, we spent uh, the vast majority of that time working with governments right across Africa to make sure that at the very least, we are providing for the continuity of trading arrangements between us. Uh, and, and on that, we've, um, we've had uh, multiple successes, actually. So where we are today, um, you know, we have uh, nine free trade agreements uh, covering 16 African governments. Uh, and in addition, we've got um, 35 African countries that are part of the UK's generalized scheme of preferences, which provides for duty-free, quota-free access uh, to the UK market for everything but arms. Um, and, and that's no mean feat, actually. And I think you know, it's really worth bearing in mind you know, what could have been, uh, but actually through, to, through the partnerships that we've got uh, between our governments, uh, we've managed to, to get all of those agreements across the line uh, and really make sure that business people, you know, exporters, importers, uh, investors, really know that there is consistency and continuity of those trading arrangements. I think the key for me is that that's the beginning of the story uh, and uh, you know, what we're doing now of course is furiously trying to implement those agreements um, and I think that really unlocks some really exciting opportunities for more government to government conversations through which we're able to talk about a whole raft of things uh, and we've got these strategic dialogues we've got working committees uh, but it enables us to bring to the most senior uh, government forum uh, it, uh, real uh, issues and opportunities and challenges that, that companies are finding. Uh, and so, you know, we're starting to see that coming through and that's really enabling us to tackle some of the market access barriers uh, that our companies tell us that they find constraining their, their desires to, to grow their business or to increase their investments across the continent. Um, so exciting times. And we're also looking at how we can improve that generalized scheme of preferences 
so for the, some of the, the, the least developed countries uh, on the continent, uh, and we're hoping to open that up to some consultation very soon. So watch this space. Sounds really exciting. And, and Denise, how, how is it really working? And of course, uh, and as a preamble, uh, you, you, you represent one of the uh, financial institutions that has got the wider, uh, one of the widest coverages uh, from a country perspective in, in Africa, and of course, a lot of influence. Um, how, how is the flip side of the coin? How, how is Africa welcoming the UK, knowing that, for example, uh, we, we, we have a lot of political drive from the Chinese and, and, and some other emerging countries who want to effectively take the opportunity to, to, to gain some ground uh, in, in terms of influence in Africa? How, how, is, how are African institutions looking at this new global Britain? No, thanks, Joe. And I think, you know, as Emma set out, I think there's a huge amount of work going on to have those conversations and to ensure there was engagement in the run up to, to Brexit. Because, you know, to be honest, anecdotally from a lot of our clients, there were some concerns around, you know, as you say, that continuity, you know, especially markets like Kenya, who have significant um, um, reliance on the UK market in terms of fresh produce and flowers, then, you know, we were hearing, you know, some rumbles. So I think the, the preemptive work and then the rapid and swift engagements around putting the, the, the refreshed trade agreements in place have certainly been welcomed by, by clients and markets as a whole. Um, I think, you know, moving forward, yes, we come from a, you know, significant trade history between the UK and Africa. And I think there is a genuine desire to continue and to grow that. But as you say, it's massively competitive. Um, and, you know, if it was only the Chinese, but as you say, we've got the rest of the EU, we've got Turkey, we've got the US, you know, increasingly Southern Asian countries, in Japan, Korea, you know, everyone wants to be in that exciting marketplace that is Africa. So, you know, what, from my side, what do I see our clients asking for? Well, they, they, they want the UK to be easy to do business with, and they want the UK to be bringing the best of what it has to offer to Africa to help it to address its, its challenges, whether that be around infrastructure, around ESG, um, around developing the pharmaceutical sector, something which has been very much top of mind uh, for us recently. And as Africa urbanizes, we're a very urban economy. We've got some great know-how around PPPs, around smart cities, water, waste management, you, you name it. So I think the UK has a huge amount to offer. Um, we see a huge amount of interest in, in, in Africa um, engaging with us on that. But we have to be easy to do business with going back to the trade agreements and we have to put the right incentives around that through public private support to make it happen thank you very much denise uh, i think that's that really really captures the spirit and and andrew if i may turn to you um we we, we talked about uh britain uh, and 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 how britain is trying to lead the way in in, in establishing uh, new trading routes with, with Africa. Uh, Denise has told us a little bit how that's being perceived from the African side. But there, there's an angle that we haven't explored here, which is uh, all of a sudden uh, the African continent has thrown a spanner, a spanner in the works, leading the way in terms of establishing uh, the largest uh, free trade area since the creation of the, the WTO. How does the... Um, ACFTA, uh, the, the Africa Contin Continental uh, Free Trade uh, Agreement uh, work in, in the midst of all of this. Is, is intra-Africa uh, a real threat uh, to, to, to the UK's influence in, um, in the continent? Uh, I'd say the opposite. I think, uh, firstly, I wouldn't be the first person to say it's a little ironic in terms of its timing. Um, given the, the Brexit followed by Africa is an interesting series of timings. But, but overall, uh, and you look at it from Africa's point of view, this is a wholly positive move. It's, as Emma said earlier, very early days on how that's going. But if you look at the level of intra-Africa trade at the moment, it's puny. And the number of people in Africa is very high, sort of 1.2, 1.3 billion looking to double. So the opportunity is very significant. And it's particularly an opportunity around 
scaling up business uh, in Africa. And if you scale up business, which at the moment is challenging to do, then you get massively more opportunities to invest. And if you have opportunities to invest, that's where people like uh, businesses from the UK, who've historically done a lot of business in Africa, but increasingly trying to find it difficult to expand those businesses, are able to do that. I mean, I've been talking to people, for example, in the auto industry who are looking at setting up hub and spoke um, supply chains uh, using a hub in one country and spokes in, in other countries to try and develop their businesses. And all that gives massive opportunity. And I think um, sometimes we look at this in the, the wrong way. I think uh, if you focus too much on the UK side of things, uh, it can send the wrong message and the wrong narrative. Uh, what needs to happen is this is a partnership, uh, a respectful partnership, uh, which will develop business for the, be for the benefit of, of all parties, which includes the UK, in doing proper business. And we can talk about some of the legal aspects which make that easier uh, later on this conversation. But if you're looking at uh, what could be done, you're, you're looking at adding value in Africa for Africa, but with the support of a ton of people from outside Africa working together in it. So I see this as nothing, nothing other than positive. I see it massively positive for both the services sector where I operate in and other sectors. Um, and I know that the UK government is 100% supportive of this and is uh, fully behind it as well. So uh, nothing but good, as far as I'm concerned, coming from the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. That, that's, that's indeed good news, Emma. Yeah, I just wanted to add in on the back of that, actually, because from a UK government perspective, look, I think it really is, uh, it sort of speaks to the, to the dynamic prospects uh, that Africa has to offer. Uh, and, you know, imagine, you know, uh, what we've seen in the East African community is a lot of companies coming in excited at the prospect of not only being able to tap into the Kenyan market or the Rwandan market, but, you know, 450 million people in the East African community. So you triple that then um, uh, once you get the African continental free trade area actually up and running and really driving scalability of African companies, uh, creating you know, just the most extraordinary dynamic market for UK and other international companies. I mean, that is game changing. Uh, and, and as part of that, uh, uh, in my network, I've uh, built a small team, a uh, small and perfectly formed team in Ghana to sit where the, uh, the AFCFTA secretariat is established in order to build and really, really create a strong partnership with, with that organization so that we can understand the direction of travel, we can uh, help to share any of our expertise that might work, uh, some technical assistance along the way too, uh, to really make, make a success of this because this is the game changer that, that Africa's economies is looking for, I think. Yeah, just to pick up one of Denise's points there, it's, um, this is a high, it is a highly competitive market and you only have to look at what Mr. Macron's been doing recently going around in historically Anglophone countries. But this is something which um, that was, I think, the point of Brexit, that we could be more competitive and that everyone is more competitive and that therefore everybody should benefit from the competition in terms of doing that. So I, but we absolutely shouldn't underestimate the level of competition there is. And the UK needs to up its game, which is hopefully what we'll be doing. So when, when, you, when you establish uh, a team, as, uh, as Emma's put it, uh, right at the heart of it, liaising with, with the, the, the core of the ACFTA, automatically you, you win that ticket to be, to be part of the, the discussion. Quite, quite, uh, Quite an ingenious move, if I may say so. Uh, Emma, I, I know it may sound a little bit cheeky, but uh, just to, to round up this, uh, this part of the debate, um, what's your three-minute pitch to, uh, to, to, to both the UK and African counterparts uh, when well, they are trying to sell Global Britain? Well, look, I love it when you're cheeky. So, um, uh, I mean, I'm not going to give you the three minute pitch, but what, I, what I'll just kind of put together the, the various elements of it. And we've, we've touched on, on quite a bit of that already. And so, you know, to a UK audience, you look at Africa and it is vast. 
it is dynamic, it is exciting, uh, is 1.3 billion people and growing at pace, as Andrew has said, it's fast urbanizing, it's young, uh, it's ambitious, it's highly entrepreneurial. Uh, and, and, you, and so the, the opportunities, for me, this speaks about opportunities. And you know, that whole you know, education, education, education bit, it's opportunities, opportunities, opportunities. So you know, to my mind, you know, we've seen uh, we've seen the extraordinary transformation taking place uh, across Africa, um, you know, accentuated by the pandemic uh, in some cases. But you know, education coming online, mobile money, fintech, um, uh, online healthcare provision, uh, extraordinary, uh, uh, the fastest growing internet markets in the world. Uh, you know, there's there's so much going on in Africa, and I think if you just listen to the headlines uh, uh, on the news bulletins, you don't you don't see any of the dynamism and the excitement that I think those of us living and living and working on the continent see. Um, and and I think really exciting opportunities. So not only in the next thirty years will we see you know one in four global consumers living in Africa, like boom, mind blowing for, for, for companies. Um, but you know, we're also, uh, you also look at, look at the facts of investment into African entrepreneurs, into African infrastructure projects. You know, they have, uh, they have really high levels of, of success and return rates. Uh, you know, so it's an exciting, it's an exciting um, place to be. I think if I'm talking to African buyers, uh, I'm talking about world-class expertise and experience from the UK. I mean, it is world-leading across so many different areas. We have, you know, end-to-end -end, uh, capability across so many sectors. You know, we've got massive research and development capability, really strong educational institutions as part of that, uh, and, uh, you know, a global, internationally-minded workforce. Uh, and, and, you know, so I think that to, together, you know, I just see time and time again the partnerships that we get when we bring Africans and, and Brits together in the business space uh, and you see an, an extraordinary uh, potential and we're increasingly we're turning that potential into reality. My lamb's fault, definitely. <laughs> let's move on. Let's let's talk a little bit. So we, 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 we now have the polls. We know where things are. Um, let's move on. How, how do we... How do we create the infrastructure uh, to, to support all of this? And, and Andrew, if I may start with you, um, what, what, what does the UK need to do to create, in particular, the, in particular, that financial infrastructure that will support those exports and that investment into, into Africa? I think as Denise will probably confirm, um, I think most of the infrastructure, the infrastructure technically is there already. What we need to, that, to have is um, a coherent and compelling uh, narrative as to why the UK should be the financial hub for a lot of work which goes on in Africa. And that, you know, it, that obviously very much includes trade finance. But you start from things which are global, like uh, what you need to have trade working, you need to have sovereign debt um, under control or managed. And I think that's absolutely critical and without sovereign debt being sorted out that's a real challenge uh, a lot of a lot of money is being spent at the moment on vaccines and healthcare uh, which were, might otherwise be supporting sovereign debt so that's the first thing and i know that the uk and fcdo for example are working very hard on this alongside a lot of others and that's both a public and a private play because people often forget that a very significant amount of that debt is owned uh, by bondholders who are in the private sector. So I think the first thing is that the, that side of things needs to be dealt with. But then you're looking at how to support, how you're going to support trade and you're getting a lot. So that's, an, again, a public-private uh, collaboration, which means that the government, which it is doing, is, is, has to be out there and saying, we believe in Africa, we believe in trade in Africa, and we're going to support it. So you've got the UK export finance people, you've got the Garantco people, you've got that sort of thing supported by the private sector banks who are looking to do a lot of trade and a lot of the trade by a lot of the banks is done out of London and that is clearly going to be important so I think it needs um you know we need to pull it I was talking to some of my banker friends only last week on, actually on the AI African Investors Group and they're very keen to promote uh, London as, a, as the hub for Africa finance and trade and I think that can be done as I say the infrastructure is there 
but it's a matter of making sure that we follow through. FinTech, really important. A lot of the investment, uh, private, private equity and other investment at the moment going into Africa is through FinTech. Uh, London, UK is a hub for FinTech. So I think that the infrastructure is probably there. We need to focus on it, pull it together and give it a, give it a proper narrative to sell it. So I think that that's, um, I could go on a long time, but I think that's, that's where I'd say. And uh, uh, your members should be delighted. I mean, there's a lot of support um, for trade, I think, available both from government and the private sector, and it has to work together. 100%, I couldn't agree more. Let, let's break that down. And, and Emma, perhaps returning to you for the, 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 the public side of all of this. So, you know, Andrew said it, and, and I completely agree, and particularly now uh, in, in, in the post-pandemic where uh, sort of risk aversion got even mm -hmm. uh, exacerbated. I mean, this trade finance gap that uh, I've lost count of, of the number of uh, interventions that I had in, in, in conferences in Africa that, that were entirely focused on the trade finance gap and, and, and COVID won't make it any better. Um, and, and there seems to be some sort of consensus that uh, the, the public institutions, governmental sponsorship is, is very important to overcome this. And of course, the UK has got UKF um, and Garanko, as as, uh, as Andrew uh, pointed out, do, do, are there any uh, data points already that, that show uh, an increased involvement uh, between the UK, EF, Garanko and, and Africa to support this trade? Yeah, I mean, we've also got, uh, you know, our development finance institution, CDC, and we've got PIDGE, which looks at infrastructure development, uh, and you know, take it all together. And actually, I think it is a strong story. Um, let me take CDC first, actually, because you know, what they did at the start of the pandemic was to, you know, to recognise the uh, the, the challenges and to, to introduce a sort of counter cyclical approach, uh, you know, making sure that the, the, the companies that they have equity in has liquidity so that they could continue to operate and you know, stem the, the potential flow of, um, of job losses and, 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 and bankruptcies and so on. Uh, and that's been really powerful. And, uh, and I think in addition to that, what they've, um, what they've also done with their very strong Africa focus uh, is, is layer on top of that, um, you, of course, they're looking at job creation, they're looking at infrastructure and agriculture, uh, but they're layering on top of that a very strong commitment to green and clean growth. Uh, and so you know, they've said that, uh, you know, in the coming years, so all of their portfolio of investments uh, will be uh, you know, aligned to the Paris Agreement and, and help us go to a, a, you know, a carbon, uh, net carbon zero uh, economy. But you look at UK export finance and similarly, you know, they've pledged two billion pounds worth of direct lending to Africa for clean green uh, projects. And actually over this last year, we've seen the first of those. I think it was a global first. Um, although I'm slightly prone to <laughs> saying everything is a global first that we're doing. Um, but, uh, but it was a, a really innovative solar powered nanotechnology water project in Ghana to bring you know, fresh uh, drinking water to thousands of Ghanaians living in uh, sort of uh, rural and peri-urban areas. And it's that kind of initiative that we can, we can see happening all across the place. But scaling that separately also this year We've seen UK export finance uh, land its largest ever, <laughs> again, I'm sort of global, largest ever global infrastructure project, but it's true um, with uh, supporting two monorails in Cairo, new Cairo. Uh, and so you know, that, that speaks to the importance of creating new infrastructure, physical infrastructure, uh, as well as you know, taking you know, thousands of cars off the roads, reducing carbon emissions uh, as, uh, as you start to see new Cairo coming, coming into to, to life. Um, and, and beyond that, you know, we're seeing UK export finance supporting hospital building and road building, um, markets uh, revamping in Ghana and supporting airport uh, reconstruction and, and uh, revamping. Um, so there's a huge amount of stuff going on. Uh, so much of it actually about how do we how do we impact people's lives, uh, you know, make life better for more people, uh, enabling transport, creating infrastructure, supporting healthcare and education provision. Uh, so, so I think you know, UK export finance have done a terrific job across Africa. We've really seen their, uh, the deals that they've landed here increase over the last 
few years and particularly since uh, since they've started to create an international presence of their own so interconnected with my network across Africa we now have four UK export finance international executives who are on the ground uh, really working directly with us to uh, assess projects, drive more projects, uh, more projects to, to completion. Uh, and that's proving to be highly successful for us. And, and I guess, uh, and, and it speaks for itself really, but I guess that after a, a, a sort of a lukewarm start a few years ago, uh, UKEF is really positioning itself as a, a, as a driving force and, and just food for thought. No need, to, no need to answer now, but imagine the potential this could have uh, just just hinting at an idea here, uh, Emma, uh, if if the UK export finance would link directly uh, with with the development banks that are currently fueling uh, Africa's uh, trade finance. I mean, and I'm specifically talking about the Frexim Bank and, and, and the Africa Development Bank. So perhaps a, a, an angle to explore. And in fact, some of that is already happening. So there is already a partnership with Afrex in Bank. Uh, there's there's um, conversations and, and actual deals where um, UK export finance is, is in the room with African Development Bank, for example. So yes, there's always room to do more, um, but we've, we've started. That, that's fantastic. That's great news. Uh, Denise, and how about the private side? I mean, I, 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 um, I must confess, and, and of course I'm slightly biased here. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, because I, I experienced it firsthand at Crown Agents Bank. We we much like ABSA, truth be told, um, we 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 have been uh, supporting trade flows uh, and not just for, for for UK exporters, but stemming from from countries that are normally considered difficult, such as Liberia, Sierra Leone, Gambia, even Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, um, but. I wonder if the, the the UK high street banks are ready to do that. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> normally uh, I, I get a, a sort of a recurring uh, recurring uh, complaint, if I may say so, uh, that uh, that the UK is boosting or trying to boost trade with with, with Africa, but some of the high street banks uh, don't even have confirmation lines for some of the main banks there. Mm. What are you and it's a, it's a it's a great point you raise, and I think um, you know you're you're, you're right. It, it's also something that um, that we hear. And as you say, if we're going to get UK exporters excited about doing business with Africa, we've got to help to enable it. And you know, I agree with, with Andrew and Emma and and your suggestion. Partnership is really the way forward here, and particularly between public and and, and private sector. I think, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of international banks de-risking on Africa um, for a whole host of reasons, whether that be political stability, compliance and AML regulations, or a whole host of, of, of areas. And I think, um, you know, that unfortunately, we also saw that uh, um, increase during COVID. So the availability of lines is an issue. But I think if I was a UK exporter, what I'd be challenging my my local bank around would be, well, who are you partnering with in Africa to help me to access those African markets? Um, I'm pleased to say that ABSA has a stated intention of becoming a bank of banks to really leverage our on the ground presence, not just in our home markets, but across Africa, to really do that legwork in terms of building the relationships with a myriad of small banks that are relevant to the potential customers that, are, that uh, UK exporters want to speak to. Um, and for us to do that risk assessment and allow us to become that conduit between the, the UK High Street Bank and the African bank and the African buyer. We've used um, and we've developed something called the UK, sorry, the, the ABSA Trade Hub to support that. And that's, as I say, that's a conduit that's really about bringing together parties who want to do business together, but want to de-risk the transaction and to reduce the payment terms as much as possible. And that's something that I think, you know, a lot of international banks are already accessing and already benefiting from. And that's something that I really think that we can use going forward. Incidentally, it's also allowed us the opportunity to partner with CDC and other DFIs, including AFDB, to look at risk participation agreements, which allow us, you know, African banks have 
constrained balance sheets, there's a lot of regulation around, um, but have allowed us to introduce liquidity into the system, um, to allow us to uh, introduce foreign currency into the system and to reach and sort of grease the wheels of trade, which was essential during COVID. Um, and also to reach some of those SMEs that are struggling to secure trade finance in their own right. So um, there are options out there. I think having a, a, a you know a, a nice dis uh, discussion with your high street bank is, is the way to go. Agreed, and, and it can be highly uh, complementary as well. I mean, the, 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 the high street bank will tend to, to have that long lasting relationship with the, with the exporter, the, the account bank. And, and you know, quite frankly, if, uh, uh, if they can provide the liquidity pre-export uh, against a confirmed letter of credit, and if an aggregator such as APSA and of course Crown Agents Bank and so many others in, in, in the London market, thankfully, uh, is forthcoming, then the, the, the entire cycle can be completed, but from a from a personal point of view, I'd like uh, I'd like to see the, uh, the 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 main UK banks, the so-called high street banks, becoming uh, becoming a bit more involved with Africa as well. I guess this this entire story around de-risking has uh, has uh, taken enormous uh, proportions, and and we 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 have entire countries risking uh, being. Uh, completely excluded from from the, the the financial settlement system, which could be catastrophic. And then again, uh, in a little bit more food for thought, if you allow me. Uh, but but it, it it does depend. It comes to a point where it does depend on um, on 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 uh, sovereign support uh, for for to avoid these things. Um, you know, and 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 perhaps. Uh, one of the topics for G7 or G20 uh, needs to become this this de-risking and 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 uh, an overly dependent world on 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 US dollars. Moving on a bit, um, how, how about the legal side, Andrew? Uh, we 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 know that uh, Africa is still a little bit of a, a web of a francophone regime uh, with Ohada, uh, of course, anglophone. Uh, with, with the, the likes of Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, and so on, and and you know, for 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 uh, someone who's Portuguese like myself, uh, I would say that the, the lusophone is also still there in in some of the uh, Portuguese partner uh, countries in in Africa, such as Angola, Mozambique, Cape Verde, and so on. Uh, but but for an exporter or for an investor, that this can be quite a difficult web to navigate, can't it? Yeah, I think you, you you put it very well. There's a there's a web of laws, which francophone, anglophone, lusophone. Uh, there's a South African hybrid uh, law and a lot of local laws uh, on top of that as well. Um, but basically, what business looks for, I mean, forget the um, the techniques of legal stuff. But what business looks for is certainty. And if you can get certainty of law and certainty in particular of enforcement of agreements, then that's what people are looking for. This isn't an Africa point. This is a, an emerging market point. It's a doing business somewhere where you're not comfortable, um, that it's where your home is point. Uh, and I think uh, speaking as an English lawyer, I mean, as, a, as Hogan Lovells, obviously we work under all those sorts of laws, but uh, as an English lawyer, you would say the majority of big financial deals uh, on the continent are signed under English law, um, which helps uh, which helps London in particular. Um, but then the question is how you actually get those enforced. And uh, increasingly, there's a challenge uh, locally with the separation of powers between having an, a, a judiciary which is independent uh, and making sure that you can enforce your laws under whatever uh, your contracts under whatever law they are. Uh, so a lot of our a lot of our clients and a lot of people and a lot of the um, your your the, our listeners uh, will be doing uh, agreements under arbitration, uh, often with the uh, the seat of arbitration being um, in London, Paris, Singapore, New York, but often with those being heard locally. And I think that it's uh, uh, the the structures are in place. You have to be very careful, and then those um, awards are then enforced through bilateral treaties. So. I think that the the position is clear. Um, 
English law and rule of law are important, but you go if, if you don't have rule of law, you don't, you know, I, I would say this wouldn't die as a lawyer, but if you end up without rule of law, you have real challenges. I mean, look at some of the things going on at the moment. Nigeria have just had a judges strike. Uh, this isn't good for the legal profession. And uh, there's, there's a number of areas where judges have been, uh, in some countries where judges have basically been fired recently, and we need to be careful. So I think that the uh, we're not going to see a fully localization of um, of the legal process for a while. Uh, clients want certainty. You get certainty going through the arbitration and route uh, and through use of uh, international law. So I think that will continue. The UK Ministry of Justice is is looking is is actually interestingly looking outside of the UK in a way it hasn't done historically. I think it's fair to say. And so one of the groups I'm sitting on is working alongside Nigerians to, to work to see how we can uh, support uh, and work together with Nigerian the lawyers and the Ministry of Justice in Nigeria. I think it's really important. Again, I hate to say it, but you go back to partnership. This is a matter of um, us supporting each other. Um, at Hogan Lovells, we work very closely with law firms in at least 50, 52 countries, uh, and we treat that as a partnership. Uh, and it's important to make that work because that works for our clients and make sure that their agreements become uh, workable. Agreed. Thank you very much. Let's um, let's focus uh, now on, on a sort of a forward-looking exercise uh, for, for for the rest of the conversation, if if I may. Um, Denise, I'd like to start with you and with a slightly uh, provocative angle because. We, we've touched a lot about, you know, one-way flows between, uh, between the, 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 the UK and Africa. And of course, uh, Emma uh, has also made the pitch for, 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 for the reverse. Um, but technology has been a key driver towards the, the, the widening of the uh, African financial sector. And I think it's widely accepted that, that, that Africa has in fact pioneered a number of initiatives such as uh, such as mobile money that have helped Africa continue to take uh, to take leaps forward. Has this accelerated change in in in, in Africa, and has COVID had a role in it? Um, what what are some examples of these initiatives that uh, uh, you think uh, could be effectively uh, exported uh, into the UK? Uh, particularly with a focus on, on on the fintech side of things. Okay, so I mean, you're you're so right. I think the the African market has had um, significant amounts of um, financial disruption. I mean, you know, going back uh, not too long, we would talk a lot about financial inclusion, and you know, the desire of of uh, you know to have many more people within Africa participating in the formal financial sector, holding bank accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Through the whole dynamism of the telecoms industry, I think we've completely leapfrogged that as we've moved into, into mobile money. And as you say, Africa's really been at the forefront of that technology. Um, I think you know, the development of M-Pesa in Kenya now feels very, you know, almost, no, do I dare say, you know, it, it's become very normal. And really now it's looking at how can that M-Pesa technology be moving to providing other financial products and services, for example, you know, micro loans or um, trade loans between, you know, moving from being a person to person to being a, um, a B2B tool, um, which has, you know, allowed um, companies to extend trade credit to each other, you know, to organize insurance, you know, there's, there's now, um, app-based um, mechanisms and made to international payments. If you know if you're if you're importing products in, in a number of markets um, that we've been working on, so huge amount of, of activity that's um, that, that's really come to the fore in that. And and you're right. I mean, there was a lot of this happening anyway. A lot of this is enabled, obviously, by banks standing behind. You know, we still hold the, the, a lot of the, um, the, the, the liquidity which supports all of these systems and also the regulator, you know, government have, have embraced and at the same time, you know, just watched how this has developed and some markets have allowed it to develop more than, more than others. 
along comes COVID and all of a sudden we need to still work. We need to be able to pay people to purchase things, to, uh, you know, to, to pay our taxes. Now, and then suddenly government gets very interested. And so we suddenly saw transaction limits uh, increasing. We saw caps on tariffs and, and reduced entry fees to really encourage the population to, to embrace this technology even more and, and successfully so. Even in trade finance, you know, people still needed to import food, medicines and, and everything else to go on with daily life. And we saw a massive uptick in the use of our trade manager platform, as opposed to we all, all of us have been involved in international trade to know that as long as we've tried to get away from paper, paper keeps coming back. But I think COVID has really had that, um, has proved to be in one respect a positive, Philip, in terms of, of, of moving that forward. So. I think we're going to, you know, we've got very tech savvy, young consumer base in Africa. Um, you know, I think Africa's very, and I'm going to borrow one of Emma's global. I'm sure that Africa's got more entrepreneurs than anywhere else in the globe. I'm sure I've read that. And they're going to keep pushing the boundaries. And whilst we might export know-how, et cetera, then I am sure that that know-how is going to reach on our shores, be listing on our exchanges and benefiting the way that we work together as well. Uh, I couldn't agree more. That's that's precisely my experience as well. I think uh, for for many reasons, and and sometimes some of the the drawbacks that the continent has experienced, like uh, uh, not fit for purpose fixed uh, telephony uh, infrastructure, uh, has been has been a real catalyst to uh, to to the use of mobile, and 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 of course we all know. Uh, how how the internet has uh, has revolutionized Africa and brought about quite quite a bit more of a, a democratic process in 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 the mm -hmm. and uh, you know I'm fairly close to a country like uh, like Rwanda I used to 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 run a charity there and and it's absolutely fascinating the way that mobile money dominates uh, in 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 Rwanda and uh, and I I agree with you I think at some point that will uh, that will come to these shores and, and, and will be implemented as well in, in, in our daily lives. It becomes, again, a much more democratic way of, of, of trading, which is not just a one-way street. There's learning to be, to be done uh, from, from both sides. And, and Emma, turning, turning into you into kind of two, two hot topics, one of which you, you've touched upon already extensively, but, but it is ESG. It's uh, it's undeniable that the UK is one of the leaders uh, in 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 ESG and it's it's making a significant contribution in Africa. And you've mentioned some of the the initiatives that have been uh, sponsored or guaranteed by by the UK uh, UK export finance, and and definitely that is one of, one of the ways forward to uh, develop uh, the the. the the, the the trading patterns with with Africa, and the second point, Emma, perhaps uh, in 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 more with my head of emerging leaders uh, hat on, uh, um, is, is education, isn't it? Because education is 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 one of the key exports that this country is uh, is specialized in. Now, you know, when when I travel across uh, Africa, which as you know is is. Uh, or used to be quite quite an extensive uh, exercise, and and I never thought I'd say this, but I'm I'm quite looking forward to go back on the trail. Um, but but the, 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 whenever we were talk about uh, people coming here to to do their undergrad degrees or post grad or even or even doctoral research, uh, one one of the items that came across recurrently was was the prohibitive cost, and I guess there is. There's a context to that, uh, which was the you know there was the home fee and 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 the um, the, the non-resident fee as such, but the home fee was then extended to um, to uh, European Union students like myself. I, I've benefited from from it many years ago, um, but uh, but it was there. Now that it isn't necessarily, is there a middle ground to be found with? Um, with, with, with the cost of education, where perhaps uh, we, we can leverage on that to give not necessarily preferential access to, to African students, but a bit of a fairer deal? 
Yeah, let, let me let me come back on the education bit in a moment because I, I, I do think it's absolutely fundamental. Um, let me start with where well, you started on the ESG front, um, because look, I think you 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 only have to be sort of talking to investors for about five minutes uh, before people start talking about ESG, before you start realizing that you know, the, the flow of capital around the world is increasingly going into uh, you know, green, clean, impact investments. Uh, you know, and ESG really sits at the heart of all of that. Um, and I think that's really welcome. Uh, and I, I think you know, one of the things that we, we regularly see in Africa is, uh, is that investors uh, are nervous uh, and, and ask multiple questions uh, about projects, about feasibility, bankability, about governance of those, uh, those projects. Um, uh, and, and I think as possibly in part, because there's so much due diligence that goes on in, in sort of the development and the financing of those projects, you see very few of them, relatively speaking, um, fail to complete. Uh, and so, so actually, so you've got sort of a perceived risk of investing in Africa but the reality is that when you find that good project and you kind of got it through to, to financial close uh, actually that the, the the default uh, level is very low and I think sort of ESG can really help with some of this uh, and and of course you know the UK as Andrew will attest to uh, has uh, has some absolutely fantastic world-class expertise in ESG and, and helping companies navigate all of that so look I think it's really important it's it's absolutely uh, the, you know, the issue on, on everybody's lips uh, alongside the green growth uh, and uh, and all power to us and I see you know over the years when I've been going to the mining in Darba, for example, the African mining in Darba, and just the you know, first few years, uh, there wasn't really that much talk about ESG, but actually in the last couple of years, it has dominated the conversation. And it's around, you know, it's not just around, you know, digging a hole in the ground and filling it back up again <laughs> after you've finished, but this, you know, it's about how do you engage local communities and make sure that you know, new mining um, uh, projects are win-win for, for the, you know, the, the host government and local communities uh, and for the extracting company and so on. Uh, how do you make sure that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's done ethically and, uh, and to the highest possible standards. And that's where I think UK companies really, uh, you know, have, uh, have a fantastic offer um, for, for Africa's buyers, Africa's governments, uh, because we, you know, I think that sort of the standards, the ethics, the values that we bring, um, to the way we do work is so important. On your education piece, um, look, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really important. We see thousands of, of Africans um, coming to the UK to get their degrees and do their masters. Some of them supported by uh, scholarship programs that the UK government does, and that's terrific. Um, but I think what, what we've seen is, uh, is a diversification of the education system. So if you look across parts of Africa, you see UK uh, institutions that have built campuses uh, like Middlesex University, Mauritius, for example, um, you know, we've got over 80 agreements uh, between UK education institutions in Egypt alone, uh, you know, so, and different ways of doing it, sharing curricula, uh, exchanging uh, teachers and lecturers and so on to share good practice. Um, you've got Coventry University, which is highly dynamic and international, just set up its new Africa hub in Rwanda. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things going on that provides access for African students of any age um, to education. And I think the important thing for me is that we're not just talking about degrees here. Um, you know, we're talking about lifelong learning, technical and vocational skills, things that will help uh, you know, people our age uh, to transition into a different career as economies diversify and change over the years. Uh, so I think it's a really exciting, uh, exciting sector, actually. There's lots happening uh, throughout the, the sort of the range of education got a brand new British school in Morocco, for example. So there's lots and lots of stuff happening. Um, and I think um, for me, that's right at the very heart of, of the partnership piece uh, of how we help uh, to help each other to, to build skills, to, to learn about each other in the process of learning about something else. Uh, so education right at the very heart. And I haven't even touched on education technology, uh, but that's probably for another day. But it is quite uh, dominating the headlines, and and that was that was one of the things that, uh, of course, the pandemic has brought. You know, the the, the courses. I personally lecture at um, uh, at the newly renamed 
uh, Bayes Business School, uh, for, former CAS Business School within City University. And, and all the courses moved, uh, moved online and then that created new opportunities um, for, uh, again, to democratize the access to, to education. I particularly like that angle of um, bringing British-based uh, education into Africa through the, the, the campuses. And, and you've just reminded me, that I used to live in, in Johannesburg also for a while, and, um, and there is a big uh, campus of, uh, of Henley Business School uh, there as well. So that's, uh, that, that's quite, quite encouraging. I studied, uh, I studied at the ICMA Center, which is part of, uh, of Henley. Um, just to wrap this up, uh, Andrew, you, you are, of course, a, a, a key stakeholder at the, the, the Africa Investors Group uh, as a co-chair. What, what is the, uh, the, the, the role that the group is playing in, in driving the expansion of, of UK Africa trade? T tell us a bit more about that. And if, if you don't mind as well, what, what other focus areas has the AIG uh, identified to drive expansion of, of trade between the, the, the two regions? First, I have to be quite careful since my co-chair is also listening in and uh, this is a, it, it's, a, it's an interesting group, actually. It was set up um, after the African Investor Summit uh, last year. Uh, and Emma um, uh, brought, brought together a number of uh, businesses who were significant UK businesses investing in Africa. I mean, I think this, uh, from my point of view, it has a number of uh, focuses. And it's, we, we had a meeting only last week, actually, to, to re-identify those. Um, firstly, it's basically... Um, it goes back to the public-private partnership. There's an element of in, informing both the public and the, the private sector, being able to inform the public sector and vice versa. Secondly, there's definitely an element of the group being very willing and wanting to support uh, other businesses um, invest, investing in or trading with Africa and vice versa, so we can support them with our own, um, our own basic experience on that. Yes, we are looking to promote the UK, uh, promote the UK as a partner of choice. Um, yes, we're looking to sub directly support events like the Africa Investment Summit and the Asp Africa Investors Conference, but also more widely outside London to support the, the, the leveling up proposition in trying to engage others within the country uh, to do that. Where are we focusing? Well, we're focusing on particularly areas like we just talked about with COP26 coming up, for example, which I don't think we've mentioned yet, but COP26 and then COP27 in Africa. All the members in their different ways have a focus on that. So we're looking to support and inform um, and we're looking to support on capacity building as well. So there will be areas where we're we're looking to do that, but we are um, we're supportive of the government, but we're not uh, uncritical of the government. So we talk uh, there, there are areas where uh, Emma's nodding her head. She knows. Uh, there are areas where we think um, it's very important for the private sector and for Africa to be heard. For example, on areas like the just transition, fair transition, and the, in, in in gas, um, and and areas like that. So these are these are areas where we we want to be heard. Uh, we're going to be where we find barriers to trade. We'll be telling them and. I would say that to, to everybody, this isn't an exclusive organization. We're happy to hear from others. I'm happy to put it. What's good about it, and nothing's perfect, is that we, we want to be speaking uh, to government and for government to be speaking to us with one voice, which is something which historically has been challenging for our government. And we're hoping that that will um, continue to improve. And I think it is improving. So a uh, great initiative by Emma. Um, and uh, we're hoping to make it work. That's absolutely brilliant. And uh, if, if I may, I think uh, opportunity also uh, or always arises in these sort of circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, I was also uh, one of the founders and, and, and proudly still a, a member of the uh, ITFA uh, Africa Regional Committee. I think it will be uh, quite a good opportunity to have both uh, AIG and the, the ARC uh, within it for uh, having having discussions and, and perhaps thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's fair to say, yeah. Emma, as long as people have enough initials, we'll talk to anybody. <laughs> exactly. I love a good acronym and a bad acronym. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, are, we, we are the ARC. 
<laughs> Lovely. It was it was absolutely fantastic. And um, as as we were discussing offline uh, earlier today, um, I, I I really hope that we can uh, we can replicate uh, this this discussion live on stage in the, in the not too distant future. I think the discussion was uh, extremely interesting, thought provoking as well, uh, but uh, very, very forward looking. So I'd like to thank Denise, Emma and Andrew for uh, their amazing contributions and thank you very much indeed.